This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 18. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part 18, From Arranged Marriage to White Marriage. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change, and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, and we invite you to check out parts 1 through 17 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or a patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. The Contemporary History of Iran is brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group. YLG is one of the largest Iranian-Canadian immigration law firms. Their mission, rooted in the leadership of founder Afshin Yazdani, is built on continuously striving to innovate and introduce new immigration pathways for their clients. Afshin began his career as a lawyer and law professor in Iran, and his company has now made it their goal to provide the best, simplest, least risky, and most inexpensive way to immigrate to Canada. YLG has an impressive track record, hundreds of applications from Iran successfully processed every year. They are at YLGPC on Instagram. That is Yazdani Law Group. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 18. Well, it is an accepted truism that the 1979 revolution, which consolidated with the formation of an Islamic Republic, came with a concomitant crackdown on women's rights. As part of that, the liberalization of marriage, gender rules, and family laws that had occurred under the final two decades of Pahlavi rule was, within a few months, reversed and abrogated. But in the years since the revolution, an interesting trend has emerged. That is, despite the best efforts of the Islamic formalist rulers of Iran to enforce traditional heterosexual marriages with Sharia laws that place men firmly in control, a new urban social pattern has become unmistakable and unstoppable in the last two decades. Cohabitation of heterosexual partners where living spaces, rent, groceries are shared. As such, regardless of the condemnation or denial of the Islamic Republic, what has emerged is the concept of so-called white marriage, where women and men in Iran voluntarily choose to live together without formal commitment or fear of social and religious stigma or its political consequences. So, what are the social, economic, and political conditions that have led to the dramatic rise in these unsanctioned and often undocumented cohabitations? Where were things at with respect to marriage trends before the revolution and then immediately thereafter? Why have divorce rates skyrocketed in the past two decades in Iran as traditional marriage numbers have fallen? And what does it say about the young urban population of Iranians in Iran today that they are prepared to actively defy the dictates of the current regime and live together whilst unmarried. 
Well, to discuss these issues on this episode, I'm joined by an expert who has been studying these trends for years and recently published a book that speaks directly about them. Dr. Janet Afari is a Mellichamp Chair in Global Religion and Modernity and a Professor in Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is an author, an activist, and a researcher around history, religious studies, and women's studies. Dr. Afari was born in Iran, obtained her master's degree in linguistics from Tehran University, and her PhD in history and Near East studies from the University of Michigan. She is the recipient of the Horace H. Rackham Distinguished Dissertation Award. Dr. Afari is the author of several books, including The Iranian Constitutional Revolution, 1906-1911, Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, and Sexual Politics in Modern Iran. Her works have appeared in countless magazines and academic journals such as The Nation, The Guardian, and The Huffington Post, and she is the winner of the British Society for Middle East Annual Book Prize, the Dehoda Award for Distinguished Scholarship in Iranian Studies, and the Latifa Yarshatur Award for Best Book in Iranian Women's Studies. Most germane to today's episode, her latest book, for which she served as a writer and editor, is entitled Iranian Romance in the Digital Age from Arranged Marriage to White Marriage. And right now, Dr. Janet Afari joins me from Santa Barbara, California today. Hello. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and I'd like to welcome uh all your Iranian listeners and all your diaspora listeners to this conversation today where I walk you briefly through about a century of um, Iranian women's uh, history. Right, right. Let's do the, let's do a century in an hour if we we can. A century in an hour. No small, small task. I I really appreciate you coming on and it's a most interesting book, this Iranian romance in the, in the digital age, especially with respect to trends in uh, the last two or three decades in in Iran. Um, before we get to that, uh, give us some background, if you can. In the decades before the revolution, under the Pahlavi rule, uh, there was this great deal of change in Iran in the realm of marriage and family law. I want you to give us that background and lead us to the uh, to Iran's Family Protection Act of 1967 and what that meant for change in Iran. So the first thing to realize is that Iranian women have to be compared not with their European or American counterparts, but with uh, within their own um, neighborhood. So if we compare the situation of Iranian women at the beginning of the 20th century to Ottoman women, for example, or to Azerbaijani women who were living as part of the Russian Empire, we see that they were far, far behind. So the Ottomans at the time, for example, had women's journals, women's organizations, essentially, you know, more like feminist organizations and advocating women's rights. And the Azerbaijani women had been going to uh, Russian schools, and some of them were gradually becoming professionals. Uh, In Iran, though, education of women was illegal. Education of Muslim women was illegal. So other than some small pockets of missionaries would come and open schools, Muslim women did not go to school. So that's where we start. That's sort of the bottom where we start. But in a century, when given the opportunity, Iranian women make this extraordinary amount of uh, advances. So they fight for the right to education, which they get, and then entry into the public sphere in the 1930s. Unveiling happens. Uh, they start going to the universities when the opportunity is provided to them. In the 40s, they become active members of various political parties in Iran at a time when Iran is occupied by the Allies. Um, they become very active members of the Communist Party of Iran, for example, or sympathizers. And the Iranian Communist Party, I'd like to remind you, was um, you know, one of the largest communist parties of the Middle East. Right. Perhaps the other one was Iraq. Uh, and uh, Iranian women, this is uh, not just in college, but also in high school, many, many were. And so, the, you know, the ideals, the sort of idealistic notions of greater gender equity uh, and women's right to employment and professions and so forth, uh, all became very, very entrenched. Um, In 1953, as probably your audience knows, there was a coup which reinstated Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. But what happened was that uh, Iran started to have more favorable terms for its oil, and a lot of money started to pour in, 
American advisors showed up, uh, as well as later Israeli advisors for the economy. And the economy grew dramatically. And so women became beneficiaries of this growth in the economy, Iranian economy. Um, and their numbers increased in terms of both educa urban women, particularly education and employment. Uh, and so that's why in this, what you mentioned, the family protection law, is that uh, an organization known as the Iranian Women's Association you know, was introduced in the early 60s. Um, and so it was the Shah and the Shah's sister who sort of were nominal heads of it. But the organization very quickly became uh, a very important grassroots organization and movement. So it's a nice interview by Mahnoz Afghami, who was the leader of the organization at the time. She was, uh, in a way, a diaspora, and she had uh, was born in Iran, but grew up in the United States, went to college in the United States, went back to Iran, became a college professor, and was then recruited to run this organization. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, the organization had about 400 chapters throughout the country, and they started working on literacy campaigns, um, you know, teaching professions like sewing and so forth, and child care, and then very soon it became clear that women needed um, s support in marriage and divorce. And so with that came a series of what was called as family protection laws. And the family protection laws ended up giving women some rights that they had never had. So, for example, the right to divorce uh, and, is, and the right to child custody uh, until the, the children were 18. Right. And Shizam is... A position of the mother is far less favorable, for example, compared to Sunnism. And Iran in particular was worse because um, children could only stay, uh, you know, boys till the age of three and girls till the age of seven with their mother. That wasn't the case, for example, in Morocco, where they could stay with their parents, with their mother after divorce until basically they, they were able, they were ready to get married. Some things couldn't be changed. So, for example, the because polygamy, a right of a man to polygamy is in the Quran, all they could do was insert a clause that said that if a man took a second wife, he had to have the permission of his first wife. Right. And yeah. if he didn't have the permission and he ended up marrying, she could basically get a divorce and with her full rights. They could insert uh, a provision that said uh, a woman needs her husband's per permission to work, which had always been the case. But they also said, well, a man also needs his wife's permission. You know, so they did things like that. They couldn't get the right to travel, for example, for women. That became a hugely controversial issue. So there were very modest reforms. And I remember at the same time, birth control had just revolutionized mm -hmm. uh, relationship between mm -hmm. men and women. Once it was actually made available in the 1960s, it also changed the lives of urban women. So what we know from birth control is that it, it meant that women could actually delay pregnancy, could, have, could time their pregnancies, um, and could have f fewer children. And of course, health care also was a big factor. Because with better health care, um, rates of infant mortality rates went down. And that meant that the combination of these two meant that families became somewhat smaller. So this was happening in the cities, not so much in the rural areas where women still had a number so of children. So you said these, these were um, a number of modest reforms, but I should note that this was all happening quite rapidly so that, you know, if... if uh, I, I know you said we should compare to to other uh, countries in the region rather than Europe, but where this had happened over some time in Europe, um, we have a situation. I, I, I mean, I just was making the list. I mean, in the 60s and 70s uh, in Iran, abortion is legalized. Birth control becomes available. Laws, as you say, ratifying, granting women greater rights to divorce, preventing a man from taking a second wife without authorization. Um, courts begin to grant divorced women custody of children, as you said. I mean, this is all happening in a couple of decades what what does that do to the climate around traditional or even arranged marriage as we get into the so that's an excellent point because that's exactly what happens changes that had happened in europe for example the arrival of companionate marriage in the early 18th century you know um the changes that had happened in even the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century. All of this is happening and more in Iran between the years 1936, which is unveiling, and 
and really the revolution, which is so just a very short time, three or four decades, you have these huge changes happening in the country. And the whole image of the country also is changing in the media. You have, uh, you know, singers like Gugush, for example, very independent woman. She got a divorce, right. uh, for example, and, you know, wore the latest fashions, wrote her own uh, songs, for example, had her own orchestra. But journals also, women's journals that, you know, celebrated these women's and women's accomplishments. And at the, at the level of society, there's a lot of grumbling, grumbling by men, grumbling by more traditional families about these uppity women and what are they doing. And women are starting to take away the jobs of men. And why are we sending women to the universities when their jobs should be raising families? And anyway, when these women get jobs, you know, they're going to take it away from men who mm. are more deserving and should have jobs. And uh, anger about abortion that became available, anger about birth control that had become available, and anger, true anger towards uh, women who, you know, maybe got a divorce, a woman her ma- whose marriage was arranged, um, got a divorce, got a job, and then she got an apartment and started living in a residential community, which was absolutely considered outrageous. So there was a great deal of anger uh, on the level of the public. The leftist organizations um, at this time, many of them were abroad. Uh, Confederation of Iranian Students was quite big um, in terms of uh, campaigning, of course, for social change in Iran. They were also quite conservative on gender issues. So the same organization that would be radically progressive, you know, on social issues and on economic issues would have a highly conservative issues with, for example, in the leftist organizations, yeah. even abroad, uh, if two people wanted to go out together, they had to get permission from the party leader. Yeah. And then it was understood that this was with the intention of getting married, you know, not, not just having a relationship. Right. So in some ways, the political parties leadership of the political parties began to assume the role of the father figure, the patriarchal father figure. Um, So all of this is happening in the period before the revolution. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We hear this from time to time when, when, uh, even though through the prism of the 21st century, we look back and go, of course, it was important for the Shah to, you know, liberalize the country and for for these progressive reforms to take place. Um, But, but when we talk about too much too soon, this is the kind of thing we're talking about, where, where in a way society is is catching up to the laws, even though the laws have become have, become, have progressively changed. So, I read in, in one of the chapters of your book, uh, one of the authors is talking about the fact that it, by the 1970s, despite these law changes, it is still the expectation for women that they need they are going to get married and and they're going to be involved in a traditional marriage. I mean those. Those, those ideas, those concept, those perceptions of marriage have not morphed, correct? Right. And, I mean, take a look at the United States, for example, and take a look at how long it took for gay rights to emerge, become a right, and be recognized. That gays, for example, get the right to education. And how much conversation we've had. And, of course, now we're experiencing another period of backlash, right? right? right. So in a more democratic society, You have uh, lots and lots of conversations about social changes, open conversations about social changes. And gradually, through these conversations on the media, on radio, on television, public and so forth, in schools, um, you start instilling change in people. Iran was not a democracy, so it was an autocracy. So when people were angry about these things, it was very difficult to express it or talk about it. Um, and I mean, it was a country where you couldn't even run a uh, copy, copy a flyer, you know, at your university because um, you had to get permission for every single flyer you wanted to post on the wall. And most of the time you weren't giving permission. Student organizations were simply not allowed. So you have this combination is, you know, is a powder keg. It's, you have these reforms happening dramatic reforms happening, but then not really an environment where you can have a back and forth and you can have a conversation about these issues in depth. So uh, as we get to 1979, I mean, this will come as no surprise to most of the people in the audience listening. Uh, what happens uh, 
to uh, wh- whether we can um, wh- whether they had they had embedded themselves into the social practices of the society or not. The progressive laws had happened, or liberalization of laws, modest or not. Um, what happens to these family laws when the revolution happens in 1979? So the revolution is a populist revolution. It's not like what you have in Afghanistan, for example, you know, highly reactionary. It's a combination of highly reactionary views and a significant number of leftists, including some of what we call the Islamist leftists. So these are people who are in social and economic issues, want to have a more egalitarian society. And the uh, they're both like members of the Fedayeen and Mujahideen, who Fedayeen a little less, Mujahideen far more, who act student activists who have a combination of Muslim values and leftist values, but you even have them within the Islamist organizations that are and individuals who are um, and gradually come and gravitate around Khomeini and make him into a symbol of the revolution. And so because of that, uh, what happens is that uh, two things are happening. Uh, the, um, the left and the Islamists also divided women's issues into two categories. They said there are legitimate ones like water and clean water and health care and care for the children, daycare centers maybe. Uh, but also women's education was also sort of an ex- on the accepted list of things and better health and hygiene. And those are, so those were the acceptable things. And then there were things that they called the bourgeois women's rights. And anything that had to do with marriage and sex and relationship was considered, you know, sort of bourgeois and decadent. Hmm. Uh, and so you could see that in that kind of an environment, reimposition of the hijab became a, sort of a, oh, well, who are these decadent women who are objecting? We have far more important issues to fight for. We have to create an egalitarian society, and we have to fight imperialism. And so what if you have to wear the veil to basically show your sympathy to the lower classes of women who are still wearing the veil? You know, we have more these more important issues to do. So it was this very strange combination. Khomeini started systematically from the first week he was there really, attacking the family protection law, so taking away the right of divorce from women, um, taking away child custody, yeah. closing daycare centers, pushing women out of positions like judges, for example, and making it very, very impossible for women to function as professionals. But at the same time, you have a regime that starts um, expanding social services to the poor sectors of society. So there's water and electricity and better roads and there are night schools for women, particularly now married women, who can actually go to these all segregated schools, as well as mass vaccination efforts, mm, which really increases the health and, of the population. So it's, it's a sort of a combination of these things happening at the same time. So while urban middle class women are devastated, pushed out of their jobs. Uh, Many of them leave the country. Um, They sort of see their husbands either divorcing them or taking the second wife in the cities, right? Um, These educated urban men. And many of them left Iran and ended up as colonies of single women all over the United States and Europe and elsewhere. Uh, you have uh, a group of women from the more traditional social classes who become staunch supporters of the new regime because they see that through the regime they're getting water and electricity and clean, you know, paved roads and they're also going to school. When the war happens then, we move to another stage. Well, let me, I mean, first of all, thank you. This, that summary of the 20th century is, uh, you know, uh, albeit um, in, in short time and, and, and using bullet points, but that, that was brilliant. And uh, it's interesting because, so this new Islamist state um, effectively, and I know I'm, I'm simplifying, but effectively endeavors to reverse the clock on the institution of, of marriage. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't work, you know, 30 years hence, 40 years hence. But in that first decade, how successful are they under Khomeini in, in turning back the clock? You can almost think of it as um, in uh, undermining the institution of companion marriage. You can all, almost think of it as an attempt to make sex available and cheap to all men in all social sectors. 
Because what it does is that it brings back, for example, temporary marriage and encourages people to engage in temporary marriage. It also makes divorce very difficult. So it makes it hard for a woman to leave an unhappy marriage. And it re revives that very old law that says that, you know, a woman's obligation is to provide her husband with sex. Right. And if she doesn't do that, he can basically divorce her. Uh, and also giving men the right to have both uh, other formal wives and other uh, and temporary yeah. wives. So, and, and by the way, ways, you can you can marry them when they're nine years old too. They say you can marry them when you're nine year old. Yes, and there's some fathers who do that as a way of making money. But I'd like to remind your audience that the median age of marriage was seventeen and a half, and it just steadily goes up. Um, you know, today is more like twenty four to twenty seven, depending on for women. Uh, depending on where you're living. So it doesn't mean that people go back wholesale to that marriage at nine-year-old, right, right. although there are people who take advantage of it you know, right. as a way of making money. But the absurdity or the or the retrogressive nature Correct. of the, of the, the law is there. Yeah, of it yeah, essentially, yeah. is trying to take away rights from urban professional women. And the reason more traditional women don't object is that in their families, they have been marrying around 15. They're not, they haven't been going to college. They have been observing the veil. Uh, and the men have had enormous rights over their wives in these more traditional families. So to these more traditional women, what's happening is sort of a leveling up situation. You know, this uppity um, city women who don't wear the veil and prance around and, uh, you know, show off with, uh, in the media, um, they're sort of brought down, brought down to the level of us, essentially, you know, brought down to the level of us ordinary women from the more traditional classes. But then something else happens, which is the war happens between Iran and Iraq. And now the government has to not only recruit men, but it needs to recruit women right. as nurses, as nurses' aid, as all sorts of things that now that the men have gone to the war. So just as in the United States where we talk about Rosie the Riveters, you know, the generation of women in the 40s, 1940s, who came to the workforce and took occupations that men were holding before the war. And there, as a result of that, they became really quite aware of their abilities, their potentialities, and also gradually their rights. And so that's the generation that then starts pushing later on for women's rights, feminist rights in the 50s and 60s. Um, in the same way, you have a whole generation of Iranian women from these traditional classes who joined the war effort as nurses and nurses' aides and all sorts of other professions in the war front. And so what that means is that they're essentially emancipated from their highly patriarchal families. So uh, looking at interviews of hundreds of women who, for example, did this, um, you read that, you know, they would say, uh, at the call of the bugle, I would pack my bag and I would leave my family. My father never said anything because I was now fighting for Islam. Right. And then they would get joined the wild front, uh, become involved, go away from home for months and months. You know, nobody dared ask them. And then the same women were given lots of privileges. At the end of the war, they became war veterans. And so one of the privileges that they got was free education for as long as they continued their education. So here you have a, a woman who is now probably 20 years old. She's been in the war front and so she's become a lot more savvy. And now she tells her family that, you know, I can go to university and I can get a doctorate or become a doctor. And the government is paying for everything, uh, and we, which they do, which they do. And then the next thing that happened is that now they no longer even need the father's blessing to get married. So uh, from, from among their group of, you know, social, their same social class, uh, people who have now joined the war effort, even become pastoran, for example, they select partners, and the government provides loans and facilitates marriage, and there are even group marriages at this point, meaning group weddings um, mm -hmm. that the government pays for. So basically, the, the young people are released from the authority of the patriarchal father, who was supposed to find them a spouse, who was supposed to come up with the expenses of the wedding, and who was supposed to also find his son a job so that he could have a family. Although it, it matters things. which young people we talk. We did do an episode on this uh, um, a few months back, and 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 
these women that I mean that you, exactly the, the professor was making exactly this point that um, while we usually see it through the coming of the the, the prism of the coming of the Islamic uh, Republic meaning uh, the abrogation of women's rights this the war enabled a certain emancipation but it's important to note that these are the women who were coming from the more conservative and more religious families it wasn't say that's right the these liberal are the families. women right. yes these are the women who are coming from and i go a little further these are the women who are also some of them enforcing morality rules on other urban women ah, right. so for example a woman who would become a member of the female pastoran re regime her job would be to walk the streets, make sure everybody is observing their hijab, and no unrelated man or woman is sitting in a coffee shop having a coffee. But she's getting all these rights. She's getting a salary from the organization. Um, she can go to school and continue her education. She can get into a temporary marriage with another member of the pastoran. And she's provided all sorts of um, subsidies, like there were used to be before Syria got destroyed, there used to be regular travels and trips, uh, vacation to Syria and elsewhere, for example, uh, for part of a year as as part of their uh, as part of the package uh, that they receive for their salary. So they lived a far <laughs> more, in some ways, emancipated lives than the poor urban women who were, uh, you know, at, for the slightest infringement of you know wearing a nail polish or having a strand of hair showing from under the scarf. Uh, would be lashed um, in the 80s, in the 1980s. You know, you mentioned a couple of times um, temporary marriage, and I, I, I think I, I want to define that for the audience because uh, this was a revelation to me a few years back when I learned about this because not having lived in Iran, um, the only legal alternative to traditional marriage post-revolution that continues to today is this thing, this temporary marriage under Islamic law called the siqeh. Um, can can you explain what that is? Right. So siqeh and uh, is actually one of the diff elements that separates Shi'is from Sunnis. You can go back centuries and read a whole lot of literature on it. The Shi'i tradition supports uh, siqeh going back to the sixth uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq. And this, it's it's a very interesting institution in, in that you should always, whenever you see a highly rigid and highly puritanical society, you should always know that there is some alternative, some way for people to express their pent-up uh, repression. You know? right. Right. And, and the Sireh provides that. So the Sireh, it basically says that any, any man, does, regardless of ma his marital status, but a woman who's not married can enter into a relationship for sex. Uh, it could be as brief as, as a couple of hours. It could be a few weeks. It could be much longer. And the terms of it are that the man pays the woman something for her companionship during this period. She does not inherit from them. And if there are any children of these unions, she has to prove paternity. She has to go fight and show that this man was essentially my temporary husband during this period. It was a practice that men engaged in when they traveled. So any butcher or baker, you know, could be traveling in another city. He would take a Syria wife for a few days. It was something that happened um, in the more upper, uh, very, very royal families where they would have formal wives, and then they would have a number of temporary wives, sire wives, mm. uh, that the king, for example, would do, the crown prince, for example, would do. Or it would happen in if a man had a little bit more money, and maybe he, uh, you know, wanted to have a sex for pleasure, but he kind of had to be able to provide for her separately from his formal wife. And then there were men who did it as a way of, um, maybe they had a formal wife and they had no daughters, I mean, no sons, only daughters. And so a sire was a way to maybe have a few sires and see which one produced a son and then probably marry that one formally. I mean, there were all sorts of uses of it. There's an excellent book on it by Shahla Hoyri. Uh, called Law of Desire, so right, your right. readers can go. But you're go but you're that. you're speaking of it in the past tense. And it's not it's not over, is it? I mean, so no, it's not over. It's it can it, it was almost dying out in the late seventies. Few people. There were only around the shrines, you know, where generally shrines, uh, also Catholic shrines, for example, are the same way, are centers of prostitution nearby. Uh, 
Um, and it was the same thing. So near the shrines in Qub, for example, or Mashad, uh, you would have these uh, places where you could engage in a temporary marriage for a few days or for a few hours. Again, but from from a from, from a Western perspective, I, I mean, I no, I don't, no, no, I, don't no, I, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but it is just so ridiculous. E- even even the, the bureaucracy of it that you know the uh, hey, honey, we let's hook up, so we got to go, you know, get a temporary marriage for a few hours. So it just right. seems ridiculous, right? That's why the Iranian public regarded it as a form of prostitution in the 1970s, and it had almost, as I said, died out. Like no self-respecting woman would ever enter into a temporary marriage, you know. So uh, one of the things that happens after the revolution is that they are have to deal with this question of people getting older, uh, marrying later, not having the financial means to get married, and they bring it back, they revive it. They start particularly advocating it in the 1990s as a solution to what they call um you know, the, I guess they call it the debauchery of the West, you know, where everybody in the West is sleeping with everybody else. Well, we have a much better, cleaner system, and it's called temporary marriage, and you can enter into a relationship. And, by the way, it's recognized by the Sharia, so you're not doing anything sinful. Right, right. Uh, and the young people resist, the young urbanite people resist it. Um, resist it for a while. But then after a while, they realize they could use it. So, for example... A couple who's dating quietly realized that if they want to go to the Caspian Sea and they were afraid of the guardian, morality guardian, stopping them, they could get one of these certificates um, and show it, um, you know, for the duration of the trip. And then when they came back, they'd tear it up. And uh, So people gradually started using it. And today what's something is really interesting has happened is that although child marriage exists, um, I think the number... After during COVID, it went up a little bit. It has hovered somewhere between fifty thousand to I think the latest number during COVID was more like a hundred thousand, because poverty became so extensive. Uh, but that's still very small, you know, for a country with a population of close to eighty million people. What happened is that the nature of temporary marriage has also changed. So on one level, it has it is prostitution. So you go around the shrines and you you still see that. On the other level, it's become a, a little bit like cohabitation. So people in their 30s uh, who are, for example, employed, uh, they don't want to get married for a variety of reasons. They don't have the financial means and so forth. They actually might enter into a temporary marriage with the idea of... Uh, same together. Mm. Um, so people are using it. You know, this is some of the, one of the interesting things. We see how people take some of these old traditions and empty it from its earlier content and cr- add a new content essentially to it, new meaning to it, and start practicing it. And so yeah. this brings me to your question of what you asked about white marriages. Yes. Let so me ask white, you, let, let me re ask it. <laughs> Because uh, because you've led us perfectly to this point, and and the the point is um, uh, trends, studies, people like you uh, show us that there is a, a dramatic increase in cohabitations, heterosexual cohabitations in Iran that are not engaging in the temporary marriage uh and this is uh, when do we first uh, and uh, i'm going to ask you to why to, to tell us why it's called white marriage because um it's it's a bit odd that it's got a color associated with it but there's a reason for that uh when do we first start seeing a rise and an increasing number of of these unregistered cohabitations so what it is is we start seeing it rising about 20 years ago and the reason they call it white marriage is because when you get married in iran you have to take your birth certificate to the notice, the Office of Registry, and you have to enter the name of your spouse in your certificate. And the reason you do that, it was a law that was ratified in the 30s, was to prevent men from having polygamous relationships. So if you go and want to marry a second wife, you have to show your uh, identity card, and in your identity card was the name of your first wife. And you, so you couldn't lie and say that I don't have a wife. Uh, but with white, what's called white marriage is really it's a misnomer. It is cohabitation. It's no difference from different from cohabitation. But Iranians like to call it white marriage because they're suggesting that there is a sense of commitment hmm. involved in these relationships. That's not just like you know dating someone casually for a short time. 
So that's what it's called. So it's happening be for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, everywhere in the world, we see that the age at first marriage is going up and up because people have to go to school and become more educated and get a job and then save to be able to get married. So that's the first thing that we see happening. A second thing which is happening all over the world is that the desire to have multiple children is dramatically dropping too. And that's also related to the fact that as women become more educated, they have more control over their reproductive functions. Um, they realize that if they want to make something of themselves in their lives, they can, they can either not have any children or have just maybe one or two at most. And so the combination of these things uh, it means that marriage is also delayed and later and later. So uh, as marriage gets more and more delayed, uh, well, you know, what are people supposed to do? Um, you know, so the, the, uh, people want to be with other people. They want to have a relationship. And so gradually, so, okay, so you said then you say, well, why don't they get married? The reason they don't get married is, first of all, marriage still in Iran is a very formal institution. And you're, the man is expected to provide all sorts of things, you know, has to pay for the wedding, has to pay for a place of domicile. Mm. And the woman also is supposed to come up with a jahiz, um, gift from her parents for their new life. And so when you have a formal marriage, there's still these negotiations that go on between the families, essentially to make sure that the children, their adult children, are... Um, can live together, can live a comfortable life together. Well, what about the fact that you're not in a position, men are not in a position, for example, they don't have jobs, or they don't right, have jobs that right. make that kind of money, or certainly those weddings are out of reach for a lot Wedding of Wedding ceremonies, dowries, it, it's expensive. The dowries, yes. all these things, right, all these things are just making it absolutely impossible for a lot of people to get married. The other thing is that, okay, so people could maybe get married still, uh, and break these laws, uh, break these traditions, and get married. But then the problem is if you want to get out of a marriage is also a, a huge headache, particularly for women. So, you know, women basically have very limited right to divorce. I mean, they can't just go to a judge and say, I want a divorce. Uh, there would have to be reasons. He would have to, like, really beaten her up and thrown her in a hospital mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that for her to but be But the able divorce to rate is skyrocketing as well. And I exactly. wanted to ask if if those, the same economic realities, i.e. the economic problems, the unemployment, the rising poverty, the sociopolitical uncertainties, if that is the cause for the rise in divorce rates as well as the the, the, the falling of traditional marriages. Most certainly, most certainly. And most of these divorces are happening uh, in the first year and a year and a half of the marriage. And the rates are really strange. I mean, uh, going in terms of how they're going up. 2014, it was 20%. Uh, I just checked with a sociologist friend in Iran, uh, Said Madani, and it's become 30%. So one out of three marriages um, ending in divorce. And that's really, really quite high, you know for a more traditional society like Iran. And so what the newest thing that's happened is uh, I was interviewing a friend inside Iran who told me that her father told her, and this is like a more educated middle-class family, he said her father told her to go and not marry her husband formally, but enter into a temporary marriage, because if she ever wants to get a divorce, it's going to be so difficult. And then there's the question of child custody, which is really another very, very difficult thing for women to, to be able to get custody of their mm -hmm, children. Mm -hmm. So then they go to a registry um, to enter into a temporary marriage with her, uh, with her boyfriend. And the registrar says, well, you know, everybody apparently is getting interested in this temporary marriage instead of formal marriage, so we can only give you a certificate for a year. And after the year, you either must separate or you have to turn it into a formal marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, just this really difficult situation, which is formal marriage is difficult for financial and economic reasons and so forth. People are delaying marriage. And when they get into, into a formal marriage, getting out of it is so difficult, particularly yes. for women, to get out of it. And if you're in the what we you know in the West would call a common common law marriage or the white mm -hmm. marriage, you having kids. I mean, you just mentioned it. Uh, it it's uh, I, I wrote it down. Article eleven sixty seven of, Iran, of Iran's civil code declares that a child born of adultery shall not belong to the adulterer. So it means that unmarried parents have no custody rights as a couple. 
Uh, right. And only so you have a couple of options. Either you just don't have any children, which is what I understand people do. So it becomes a union between two people who don't want to have any children. Or it becomes a relationship between two people who already have children. Perhaps this is a second time around. So that's one thing. Or you, you go have a secret abortion. And the government is trying to ban that too. They just passed a series of draconian laws I don't know, the re- what was the recent law, some of the recent laws in south of the United States, making abortion almost impossible. Yes, there, there, yes. That kind of laws are being ratified to make abortion impossible for women. So there's, there's that option, which, you know, quiet secret abortion, I guess you could have, or not having any children. Uh, but, or, or else maybe you could just go and have a sire, turn your open white marriage into a sire and, then if you have any children, you say, well, it's mm-hmm. a serious relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, so those are the options for people. So l- let me ask you a few, uh, I know I can't keep you forever, but I, I, now that we're talking about white marriage, let me ask you a few pointed questions about it from a, a couple of different angles. Um, first of all, a massive percentage of the Iranian population, as we know, is under the age of 35. Um, there's sex, there's dating, there's handholding, there's drugs, there's you know all of this out of wedlock. Is it inevitable in the age of the internet that there would be an increase in white marriage? Of course, there's no question about it. And the government has just basically given up. You know, they started banning it, they started opposing it, but now they just don't say anything because they can't do anything. Um, However, society hasn't quite changed. So people who are in these relationships, in these cohabiting relationships, the problems we see are that, you know, a couple might be together for two years, um, woman usually is from another city, smaller town, maybe she's moved to Tehran, her boyfriend is in Tehran, and then the guy gets invited to a family wedding, and he doesn't take her because, you know, it's still awkward to bring her Mm -hmm. in such a setting, and Mm. how are you going to introduce her? So then, of course, this creates um, tension in the relationship. You know, every time you go to see your parents, you don't take me, you don't introduce me, you keep this quiet, and then the guy goes to the wedding, and everybody's trying to find him a spouse, right? Because they think he's he's mm-hmm. single. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's a lot of tension. Or for example, people are taking advantage of these high rises, so they live in the high rises. Uh, a woman, let's say, gets an apartment; her boyfriend moves in with her, but they try to be a little careful, you know, not leaving the apartment together, not entering in together, not drawing too much attention to themselves. So in terms of society, not just the law, but social expectations, there's still a great deal of tension that is going on. I mean, my guess is, of course, as with time, this will break down and it will become more acceptable. And then there's the question of whether the law will ultimately have to catch up with with what is Let let me get to that. But if you can try and explain, I mean, it's really... You know, it's like it's like it's like trying to unpack the the rules around what you can and can't write when you're writing music in Iran. What's mm-hmm. it's 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 so hypocritical. It's so so full of confusion and contradictions that I I can't get get a handle on it. You know, as an outsider. And so so with this law, I mean, on the face of it, it's quite remarkable that in a climate in a country where pretty much everything is forbidden, dancing, drinking, dating, there's this generation born in that environment who are simply refusing to reflect the conservative laws. So to me, it's like, well, where do they find the gumption and are they not afraid? And yet I speak to a couple of our staff members here who've come from Iran recently and they kind of go, yeah, you know, you just try and make sure that nobody finds out and you just, you know, (laughs) and I think, well, this is a crazy deal. I mean, it is a crazy deal. Yeah. And also when you say, uh, the, the, the regime has given up. I mean, they don't seem to have given up on all kinds of ways in which they exercise, you know, draconian policies and, and, and atrocities. So, I mean, how are folks not afraid to be doing this? They're incredibly brave. Uh, that's all I can say in the way that they get used to breaking all the rules and all the regulations to live the life they want. And uh, let me say this as a professor now, because we get them then as students coming to our universities, and then we have a problem because we actually have to teach them that they have to start respecting rules and regulations Mm. because they've gotten so used to the idea that rules and regulations are there simply to confine you. 
and that if you want to get anywhere in the world, you need to break these rules. And we have to put them through a whole other education, teaching them that, you know, you get university money, for example, for travel, and you have to account for every dime of it. And yeah, maybe we won't ask for, for you to give us receipts for everything, but if it ever becomes public that you use university money for something other than university expenses, then it's really, really bad, and it would really look, you would really look bad, you know. And so we have this problem here, and just at right, this end, with right. this incredibly brave generation that has to live its life, you know, and I certainly don't begrudge them or blame them for what they have to do to be able to live this life. And Dr. Offer, you, you talked a, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, parents. Where, where do contemporary parental pressures, Iranian parental pressures, fit in with white marriage? So the parents started giving up years ago um, when they realized that if their son goes out and visits his girlfriend uh, and take her to a cafe, this is I'm talking now about the 80s and 90s, for example, 1990s, that they're, they're, he might be arrested with his girlfriend and thrown in prison and lashed, they realized that they might as well open their own homes to their son, bringing their daughter or their girlfriend over, you know. And so parents became very, very liberal on so many levels. I've even heard of um, highly conservative women from traditional families who give rights to their daughters to a private party because they want their daughter to experience something about life before mm -hmm. she gets married. So yes, it's resulted in a in a significant liberalization of the culture. Not you know, not not on every level and not in every part of society. I mean. Sistan and Baluchistan is, for example, far more conservative, mm -hmm. you know, than um, than Tehran, um, but but certainly happening in many parts of the country. But it's interesting how economic disparity and difficulties can affect mindsets even amongst older generations. Because I would argue that in the Iranian diaspora, um, there's still a lot of. <laughs> Parents who are intolerant of cohabitation uh, outside of Iran, right? That uh, yeah, that's the problem of diaspora. A lot of times, and it's not just the Iranian diaspora, but people in diaspora sometimes get frozen in time. They remember things as they were when they came, but they can't identify with the new country, its social mores, its rules and regulation. So they become frozen in time, if you will. And um, sometimes what jolts them out of their position is with new immigrants coming from the old country mm. and telling them that, no, you know, in the old country, things are not done that way anymore. So true. It's so, so <laughs> well said. What, 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 do you, what do you think of the growth of messaging apps? I'm thinking of a Telegram as, as a place for single Iranians to search for a, a partner, let alone actual dating apps that have an audience in Iran. What does that say about the social stigma of cohabitation gradually fading away? So dating is changing, of course. We have an article in our collection on the internet and dating, actually. Um, and it's changing dramatically, and it's changing, you know, a, a girl in the city of Rome, for example, can go on one of these dating sites, find herself a potential date, and then have some exchanges, and then arrange to have a date in a big city in the in Tehran, for example, where they meet in a cafe. Um, so the entire tradition of arranged marriages has broken down. I don't think marriages are really, to the extent that this it doesn't mean the parents are not involved, the parents do become involved, but usually it's the young man and woman meet each other, date for a while, and then when they're sort of sure of it, they introduce the parents, um, and that's when the parents become involved in the form of marriage. So before I let you go, um, two questions. One, where do you, here's your, here's your crystal ball question, where, where do you see the future of marriage if we've graduated from arranged marriage to white marriage in Iran? Where do you see the future of it going there? Uh, one of the interesting things about not working on Iranian necessarily, you know, politics and war and things like that, but on social history is that you constantly see a gradual progress. I mean, you know, governments come and go, presidents get elected and and are removed from power. But the change is it's just continues to moving on. And as I said, we've moved from 
uh, um, a median age of marriage from 17 to for many girls in Tehran and elsewhere to 27. The birth rate has dropped to 1.6 now, uh, which is really unbelievable. Did you know that Iran produces the largest number of women engineers in, you know, compared to its uh, population? I mean, it's quite astonishing. Mm, Iran is mm. up there in terms of the highly sophisticated women, uh, educated women. This is with all the limits that the government places, you know, they're quotas for women in a lot of professions and in a lot of fields. Um, so by every measure, um, things are changing, things are rapidly moving. Uh, institutions like temporary marriage are being reformed um, and companion marriage is becoming more of a norm and women's employment is the next thing that I'm expecting to change quite dramatically. Women are formally not uh, having that high employment, but informally, when you look at it, you see women are, you know, yoga instructor, but also she runs a travel agency on the side, mm. and maybe she teaches also at a school during the mornings, you know, and so between those three jobs, she actually made, well, until, you know, recently things have really been going down because of a coronavirus and because of sanctions and so sure. forth. But yeah. Generally, uh, yeah, and then delaying marriage and making sure and living with other girlfriends for as long as you can so you can save some money. So, no, people are really, really changing quite dramatically in Iranian society, and uh, I'm quite actually hopeful in terms of a uh, social historian. Uh, a final question to you. I want to quote a passage from your book that says, White marriage signifies that sexuality, gender, and class are emerging as fault lines in contemporary Iranian society, with notions of intimacy, love, body, and self being constructed by Iranian middle-class women and men in reaction to Western culture and to marital norms in Iran. Uh, Dr. Afari, do you see sexuality and gender emerging as the fault lines in modern Iran? I would say it has always been, and not just Iran, but also in the United States. Just think about how many American elections we've had where the subject has been abortion and gay rights. Right. So sex and sexuality has been the fault line for our 20th century. Probably the most important thing that happened in the 20th century was that women were emancipated from the yokes of traditional families and heterosexual marriages also and relationships also became not the only type of acceptable relationships, you know, and people gradually became more open to same-sex relationships. I would say those are the two probably most important things that have happened, and they're also happening in Iran. I thank you so much for this. It's been energizing. It's been educational. I really appreciate your time. I'm glad to be here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Janet Alfari is a Mellichamp Chair in Global Religion and Modernity and a Professor in Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her latest book is entitled Iranian Romance in the Digital Age, From Arranged Marriage to White Marriage. We reached Dr. Janet Alfari in Santa Barbara, California today. This is full time for the Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 18. Brought to you with the support of Yazdani Law Group, one of Canada's largest immigration law firms, YLGPC on Instagram. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, where you can also become a patron of our program. Thanks to the team who make Rook Media happen. Talented Anahita, Super Patty Saw, Ponta the Artist, Savvy Roham, Aray Mehdad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashir.